All right, so we've already discussed how documented information is the key to demonstrating compliance with the standard and ensuring that an ISMS achieves its intended outcomes. Now, given its critical importance, IC 27001 dedicates an entire subclass to this topic. And that brings us to the first class we'll explore in this course. And that's class 7.5 called Documented Information. Now, let's have a closer look at this subclass. The requirements for documented information are outlined in subclass 7.5 of the support clause. And this subclass is further divided into three parts. And they're called 7.51 general, 7.52 creating and updating, and 5.3 control of documented information. Now, unlike other requirements, documented information isn't tied to a specific step in the implementation process. And that's why we're covering it first before diving into all the other subclauses in the next couple of lectures. All right, so let's begin with subclause 7.5.1, General. Now, the required activity of this subclause is that organizations include documented information in the ISMS as directly required by ISO 27001, as well as determined by the organization as being necessary for the effectiveness of the ISMS. Let's find out what that means. Now, when it comes to documented information, we need to distinguish between mandatory and additional documented information. Mandatory documented information is directly required by the standard and must be available to be compliant with the standard. Additional documented information is not directly required by the standard, but organizations are free to determine additional pieces of information that they consider as necessary for their specific needs. Now, ISO 27001 explicitly requires the documented information listed in this table. For example, according to Clause 4.3, a scope of the ISMS must be defined and documented. For more details on each item, you can refer to the lecture on project deliverables or explore the relevant clauses where they are covered in depth. Next up, let's have a look at 7.5.2, Creating and Updating. Now here the required activity is when creating and updating documented information, the organization ensures its appropriate identification and description, format and media, and review and approval. Let's find out what this is all about. First, it's important to understand that creating and updating documentation is a process that requires careful planning and attention to detail. This means that organizations need to identify how their documentation should be structured and choose a suitable documentation approach. In an information security management system, policies, standards, and procedures work together to ensure consistency, compliance, and effectiveness. They form a structured hierarchy where policies set the direction, topic-specific policies define the rules, and procedures provide step-by-step -step instructions. Now, please be aware that not all organizations follow this naming scheme you might find countless different names of these documents, such as guidelines, directives, work instructions, or maybe even level two policies. So the specific terminology may vary between organizations, but the underlying structure and concepts is typically the same. Although I have to say, some organizations tend to mix them together. So you might have a policy that outlines the direction but it's also some sort of like a procedure detailing a step-by-step -step instruction. So while that's not best practice, you might find that out there in the wild. Now at the top of the documentation permit is the information security policy. A policy is a high level document that outlines the organization's intent and objectives regarding a specific topic. It usually provides overall guidance without getting into technical details. So in ISO 27001, only one policy, only one, is explicitly required, and that's the information security policy. And this policy is supposed to set the foundation for the entire ISMS by defining the organization's commitment to information security, its objectives, and its overall approach to managing risks. So, for example, a policy might state that all critical business data is backed up regularly and can be restored in case of data loss. And this is a typical policy statement. It clearly defines the intent, but it doesn't specify how backups should be performed, how often they should occur, or where the data should be stored. 
Now, while a policy, as we just discussed, has the overall direction, it does not provide the specifics needed for implementation. And this is typically where standards come into play. So in ISO 27001, standards are referred to as topic-specific policies. And they define clear, measurable requirements that must be followed to ensure consistency and compliance across the organization. And these standards typically bridge the gap between high-level policies and detailed procedures. Now, using our backup example from before, a backup standard typically would specify, for example, the backup frequency. So let's say full backups must be performed weekly and incremental backups daily. It would also specify probably about the backup storage. So backups would probably have to be stored in at least two geographically separate locations if necessary. And it probably would also discuss the retention period. So backups should be retained for a number of days, let's say for 90 days, for example, of operational data and uh, seven or 10 years uh, for data that is uh, subject to, to regulatory compliance, for example, financial statements in Europe. Another aspect that could be covered by such a standard is the testing and validation. So to ensure that systems can actually be restored from backups, the backup integrity must be verified, for example, on a monthly basis by restoring a test file or a test system using the backup file. Now, while policies define the intent and standards establish the specific rules, procedures provide the detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to carry out the requirements in practice. They ensure that employees follow a consistent process when performing critical tasks like backups. So using our backup example, a backup procedure would provide clear instructions for IT staff on how to execute backups correctly. And with this procedure, every employee with the right skill set should be able to get the job done. Now, I'm pretty sure you know this from practice. This is probably a PDF or a notional Confluence page with plenty of screenshots outlining where you have to click, which options you have to select, and then where to store your stuff. Now, the final layer of our documentation pyramid is records. Records serve as evidence that a process has been carried out as required or as described by the standard and policy. So they provide proof of compliance, accountability, and traceability. Now, back to our backup example, the following records um, could demonstrate that backups have been successfully executed in alignment with the policy and the standard. So for example, backup logs. So automatically generated by the backup system. They would show timestamps, the, the backup type, whether it's full or incremental, and the status. So you would have like a success or fail status, if you will. We have maybe backup retention records. So any documentation that's proving that backups are stored and also deleted according to the retention policies. Encryption logs and backup test and restore reports. So some sort of record like a ticket or a document, a PDF, whatever you name it, that um, is a record of restoration tests and verifying that backed up data can be successfully recovered in case of an actual data loss. Now, these records are essential for audits, compliance verification, and continuous improvement. So without them, an organization cannot prove that backups were performed or that data can be restored in case of an incident. And therefore, you cannot prove that you actually do what your policies and your standards require you to do. And that's the purpose of records. Next up, let's have a look at 7.5.2, creating and updating. Now here, the required activity is that the organization manages documented information throughout its life cycle and makes it available where and when needed. So in an ISMS, documentation follows a structured life cycle to ensure it remains accurate, accessible, and secure. Let's go through the five key stages. Step one is about creating the information. So the first step is to create documents like policies, standards, procedures, and records. And once created, documents must, of course, be securely stored with access controls to prevent unauthorized changes. So a document management system like Microsoft SharePoint or any GRC tool ensures proper versioning and security. Backup logs and encryption records, for example, should be stored in a centralized system. Documents are also meant to be used in daily operations. So employees must follow policies and procedures 
and backups should be logged automatically. So if an issue arises, teams refer to backup logs and troubleshooting guides to resolve them. At some point, documents might become obsolete. So obsolete documents shouldn't be deleted right away. Instead, they should be archived according to retention policies. For example, backup records, older than 90 days, might be moved to cold storage, while outdated policies remain accessible for audits for a longer period of time. So that depends really on what your organization determines as necessary and what compliance regulations demand from you. And so the final step is, of course, when documents are no longer needed, they must be securely disposed of. And this could mean secure digital deletion or physical destruction of sensitive records. So backup files exceeding their retention period should be permanently removed to comply with both data protection laws and save yourself some money, as storage is expensive. And that's it for documented information.